morning brethren and sisters um, our meditation hymn this morning is hymn 58 Once again, good morning, brethren and sisters. Um, before we open our meeting with our opening hymn, I'm pleased to read for you the um, visitors who have chosen to meet with us this morning. And we, of course, we're very glad to have you here. And they are Brother Adrian Madden, Phil and Linda Clifton from Bunbury, David Maynard, from Invercargill, Cargill, New Zealand, and Marlon Jansen from Knoll and Dawndie, or Dawndie. I think it's Dawndie in the UK. So we're very, very pleased to have our visitors with us this morning, as of course we are all very pleased and uh, grateful that we can all meet together this morning to worship our God and remember the work of his son. So let's open our worship this morning by the singing together of hymn number 59.
Approach our God in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, we bow our heads before you with reverence and in humility as we comprehend your majesty and your greatness, your power, your wisdom and your might. But particularly, Father, we bow with thankfulness this morning as we acknowledge your goodness and your grace that has been extended unto us in the provision of your son, whose life or whose part of his life or aspects of his life we will bring to mind this morning. Knowing, Father, that without your mercy and without the provision of him, we cannot be saved. Because it is the one atoning sacrifice of his life's offering that has made it possible for us to draw nigh unto thee through faith in the things that he did and he accomplished. And by being drawn into a close relationship with thee, through that knowledge and through that goodness, that we might come to know thee and love thee and desire in our hearts to serve you acceptably. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this ecclesia, this building and the opportunity it affords us to gather together as a body of brethren and sisters who are your ecclesia, to worship you, to hear your word expounded and to fraternize with one another, to enjoy the company and the strength that we gain from each other. We pray all that we do today might be acceptable to you and pleasing to you. We ask and we offer you our thanks and seek your blessing on all that we do this morning, approaching you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So the reading we have this morning, which is to be given by Brother Jason, Derek Key, is from 1 Samuel chapter 13. Thanks, Brother John. Good morning, everyone. Reading with you from 1 Samuel chapter 13. Saul reigned one year. And when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and in Mount Bethel, and 1,000 with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. And the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba. And the Philistines heard of it, and Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard say that Saul had smitten a, a garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel also was had in uh, abomination with the Philistines. And the people were called together after Saul to Gilgal. And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots, 
and 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Michmash, eastward from Beth Avon. Then the men of Israel, when the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressful, distressed, then the people did hide themselves in the caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad in Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilead, and all the people followed him trembling. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring me hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offerings. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering, the burnt offerings, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And, and, and Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattered from me and that thou comest not within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered themselves together in Michmash. Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal and I have not made supplication unto, the, unto Yahweh. I forced myself therefore and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said unto Saul, thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandments of Yahweh thy God which he commanded thee. For now would Yahweh have established the kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom which shall continue. Yahweh hath sought him a man after his own heart. And Yahweh hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which Yahweh commanded thee. Samuel arose and get him up from Gilgal and unto Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people that were present with him, about 600 men. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, and the people that were present with him, abode in Gibeah of Benjamin. But the Philistines encamped in Michmash. And the spoilers came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned unto the way that leadeth the offer, unto the land of Sheol. And another company turned the way of Beth Horon. And another company turned the way of the border that looked to the valley of Zebium and towards the wilderness. Now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. But all Israel went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share and his coulter and his axe and his mattock. Yet they had a file for the mattocks and for the coulters and for the forks and for the axes, and to sharpen the goads. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan, but with Saul and with Jonathan his son was there found. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the passage of Michmash. So let us now continue our worship by the singing together of hymn number 13.
We all know the life of David and uh, the many psalms that David wrote were very prophetic of the things that the Lord Jesus Christ would suffer. Their lives in many regards were very similar. And so with that brief thought in mind, we now call upon, have pleasure in calling Brother Chris to give us the word of exhortation this morning to the subject, David, a man after God's own heart. John, my dearly beloved brethren and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, and all our brethren and sisters who are listening in online, greetings in that glorious hope that we have in our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Can we have that first photograph, Tom? Thank you. Our considerations this morning to consider a man after God's own heart, that of David, King David, as he was to become. And there is so much to consider in regard to David. And I know all of you would understand that there is so much to consider in regard to David. And uh, with the things that I've looked at and uh, been contemplating over the last few weeks. Um, it's hard to condense it into just 30 minutes, 40 minutes, but I'm attempting to do that. And what I want to condense it down to in, is in basically down into 10 points. 10 points that you can take away that would be able to distill into a man after God's own heart. And before I bring you to that. Um, not sure whether it's in focus or not, but we'll talk about that in just a second. But the 10 things that we want to look at and consider are what you might call the reasons we would understand David as a man after God's own heart. He was repentant. He was reverent. He was respectful. He was trusting, he was loving, he was devoted, he had recognition of his God, he was faithful, he was obedient, and he was humble. Now I want you for a moment just to contemplate and think of David as a shepherd boy. And just think of this photo we have here. I've Pick that out, that's in the distance. You might be able to just sort of see there the village of Bethlehem. This was the hometown of David. That's where he was born. That's where he was brought up. That's where Jesse, his father and his family lived. And this is the area where he would have looked after the sheep. And you see the rocky crags there where he would have spent his time looking after the sheep. And that's where he faced the lions and the bears that he was with God's power overcame. And that's where he spent his time contemplating his God. That's where he spent his time just sitting there thinking about the things of God. And that's where he developed his heart before his God. Time to meditate, time to think, Time to just sit there and contemplate his surroundings. An area and a time where 
no aeroplanes, no cars, no mobile phones, no distractions, just the quietness of the open country, just the quietness of the streams and the brooks running, the water, the surroundings, the sheep bleating, just all those things of nature around him that he could sit there and think about his God. And we don't often have that opportunity just to stop and think. There is our God in all his glory in the surroundings of creation. That we can stop and contemplate the wonders of his creation. The mountains and the hills and the ranges. The flowing water that he has provided for us. The sustenance of life each and every day. Our dependence upon him. And everything that we have need of comes from him and we have so much today that we take for granted but everything that we have comes from God yet we often don't sit back and just thank our God for those things whereas David had those opportunities and it is in these times that David learnt as he looked after the sheep looking and observing the sheep as he looked after them the characteristics of the sheep, those that were sick and those that were more dominant. You learn from sheep as you um, look after them, their characteristics and how to, the different sheep, the, the more dominant and, and those to um, understand their character. And it was just, it was my good fortune just early, early this year to spend three weeks up on a station um, about 900 kilometres north of Perth with um, Glenn Rogers on a station up there. Very isolated, you're miles away from anything. And I had to go out and um, fill the water cart and you're just miles from anything. And there's just silence, just nothing to distract you apart from the, the truck that I had um, there. But once that was off and there was nothing running, there was just the silence. It's, as they say, almost deafening. But you can just sit and think and you just see the wonders of God's creation around you. And that's what David was able to enjoy every single day as he went out with the sheep, with the sheep and looked after those sheep. So he would be able to get to know the very characteristics of those sheep, get to know them intimately. And that's what he took as he grew and then he became king of Israel and he was able to work with the people, those um, men that came and joined him and became his army in effect later on. He knew how to deal with them and ultimately his own brothers joined him and he became the commander of them as well. So as a shepherd boy, he already had the very grounding of being a God after um, being a man after God's own heart. And we find that, um, as we had mentioned in the reading, and you would have picked that up from um, verse 14 of 1 Samuel 13, which in reading that, it's quite a sad account because we see the demise of, of Saul. Given every opportunity to um, do the right thing and God would have continued on with his kingdom if Saul had done the right thing, but he made the choices that he did and God um, took away that opportunity from him because his heart was not right. So God sought out for, for him a man after his own heart and that man was David. And so we see um, David appears for us in the record in 1 Samuel 16. We know of his father as Jesse the Bethlehemite. And there we have the village of Bethlehem <coughs> featured in this photograph. Not particularly a good photograph, but the best I could do at this time. It just gives you that idea and you can see with the sheep there 
in the field. But we don't have any mention of David's mother. There are um, ideas of who his mother was. Um, there's a tradition that it was a, a woman by the name of Nitzavet, um, that she was, I just have information on that because I'm not going to try and um, second guess that. Um, but it, in, a, in trying to understand who, who his mother was, because she isn't featured in the foreground, um, they claim that she, she may have been the daughter of a deal, according to Jewish tradition. Um, and Jesse had eight sons, um, David being the last. But there's con contemplation that um, his wife, Nizet, that bore David, may have committed adultery. Um, and Jesse was um, obviously not very happy about that. And so his, the start of his life was not one of um, what you would call I ideal. So it brought um, trouble within, within the family. And so he was in, in one sense despised by the rest of his family. Instead of being the young, youngest son of the family and adored as often the youngest in the family are, um, he was to some degree pushed to one side. And we see that in some senses to the way he is treated by his older brothers. And that comes out to a degree in when he is sent by his father to his to take some food to his older brothers when they are part of Saul's um, army and they are facing off with the Philistines. And we find that in um, 1 Samuel 17. And that is where we find the, the story of, of Goliath. So Jesse sends um, David with a a fair um, amount of food and supplies for um, Eliab, Abinadab and Shamar. So obviously it wasn't food just for them, but also for the captain of, of the guard. And that was obviously something that was done to um, keep um, people in, in the army supplied and I guess keep on the good side of, of the captain so that your sons were looked after and maybe not put into the um, hottest part of the battle. So you'd make sure that your, your sons came home. And it said that in verse 20 of 1 Samuel um, 17, that David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper. So he made sure that the sheep that he looked after were kept well. He didn't just desert them. He made sure they were looked after. And he went as Jesse had commanded him and he came to where the, um, the army was camped um, and was going forth to fight and the shout of the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage or the, uh, the supplies that he had bought with the keeper and he ran to the army and came and saluted his brethren, so his brothers. And this has been going on for some time. And it is mentioned in here that it had been going on for a period of 40 days. So that's more than a month um, that they'd been facing off between Goliath and the army of Israel. So what do we know about 40 in scripture? But that's a, um, a period of 
probation. Um, so we see in this that there was nobody in Israel that was preparing to face off with life. They saw him as an obstacle to um, anything progressing. Nobody in the camp of Israel was prepared to stand up and, and make a stand about, against this man. He was a giant of a man in their eyes and they couldn't see any way around it. And then David comes in. He's but a youth. And uh, I can, I think, safely say because um, John and uh, Naomi aren't here. But their son, Corey, he's a redhead. He's about 17 years of age. And I picture in him, um, in my mind's eye, he'd be about the same age as what David would have been in this situation. And being a red, redhead, I picture in him a similar sort of the features that I would imagine David would have looked like. Um, as the scripture says, of ruddy appearance, but of a goodly looking man. And uh, he was, it would seem, about 17 years of age at this stage. Yet, because his heart was set in the things that he loved of God, the idea of facing off with Goliath did not have any um, fear with him whatsoever. He understood and knew that God was his strength. God was his tower. God was his, um, his power and his strength every day because he knew when he was out in the field that God had already delivered him from the lion and the bear. So what was this man who was facing up with Israel going to do against the power of the God that was in his hand? So in going forth to Goliath, it wasn't David himself that was his strength. He was going out there with God at his right hand. And so for us, when we face issues, when we face issues that we face personally or fears that we have, um, we need to keep in mind that we can do all things through God who strengthens us. And we, we need not fear because if we trust in God, he will deliver us from the things that we, we fear. And Goliath is symbolic of sin and the power that it has. It looks like a giant. It looks huge and it looks as though we can't overcome it. But God is able to give us that strength to overcome these things and to de deliver us from the sin that so easily does beset us. But because David had the mind of God within him as a man after God's own heart. He was able to face that giant and with that stone that God was able to guide and direct it to the head of that man and bring him crashing down to the earth, he was able to overcome sin and destroy the consequences of those things. David also faced another issue in his life which became a thing that followed him for many years. And that was the issue of Saul, who chased him and pursued him and tried to kill him many times. And it was because Saul um, realised that David was quite possibly going to take the throne and his son Jonathan was going to miss out. And Saul couldn't come to grips with that. And uh, he went all out to try and do whatever he could to, um, on a number of occasions, try and pin David to the wall with a javelin or to get his men to find David and to kill him. But it didn't matter what Saul did. God was with David and was able to deliver him 
in whatever circumstances he was, was in. In 1 Samuel 19, we find a number of these things um, in regard to um, Saul and David fleeing from him. Actually, 1 Samuel 18. And we see the, the difference between David and Saul. 1 Samuel 18, we have a number of occasions in which um, David is referred to in verse 5. And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him, and he behaved himself wisely. And, da and Saul set him over the men of war. And then in verse 12, and Saul was afraid of David because Yahweh was with him. And then in verse 14, and David behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and Yahweh was with him. And then in verse 15, wherefore when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. And then in verse 30, oh, sorry, verse 28, first, and Saul saw and knew that Yahweh was with David. And then in verse 30, then the princes of the Philistines went forth and it came to pass after they went forth that David behaved himself more wisely. So it was something that Saul didn't understand because the spirit of God had departed from Saul. And no matter what Saul tried to do, God was with David and it was not going to be an easy thing for Saul to come to grips with. Whatever he tried, he was not able to um, do what he wanted in regard to Saul. And just before I move on, I just um, forgot to mention that I don't know whether you've actually considered, but in relation to the... Um, the idea between David and his brothers. Um, but there's a correlation between David and his brothers, Joseph and his brothers, and the Lord Jesus Christ and his brothers. We know how Joseph was tre treated by his brothers. Um, he was despised and treated by them um, not very well. David, the same way. He was initially despised by his brothers and treated them very unfairly. They, when he came to the, the battle, they referred to him as, you've come to see the battle in the naughtiness of your heart. And that was far from the truth. David's heart was by no means like that at all. Um, and they misunderstood him at that stage. And like... Um, Joseph and his brothers, it took a period of time for Joseph, um, for Joseph's brothers to realise that Joseph was not by no means the sort of brother that they thought he was, and he became ultimately their deliverer. And the same with David. Ultimately, his brothers realised that this was a man who was a godly man and he became their commander. And ultimately with the, Lord, uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ and his brothers, they ultimately realized he wasn't mad. He wasn't doing things that were crazy. He was doing the things of God. And they ultimately realized that and followed him. We also see that David developed a very intimate relationship with the son of Saul, Jonathan. And that intimate relationship was a relationship was, that was one that surpassed the love of women. And Jonathan was the heir apparent to the, the throne of Israel at that time, being Saul's son. And that's what Saul really found very difficult to um, come to grips with. Um, but Jonathan 
saw in David the godly char characteristics, and that's what he truly loved. And it was like the relationship between Paul and Timothy, Paul being the older man and Timothy being the younger man. But their relationship was such a godly and spiritual relationship that they had such a bond because of those things. And the same with Saul and, and, Paul, and David and, and Jonathan. Jonathan was the older man, David was the younger. But the relationship and the way they were knit together was because of the godly things that they both understood. And they tried everything to be able to spend as much time as they could together, even though Saul was making it very difficult. And Jonathan had to be very careful. And on one occasion, he, his life was really in danger, um, but he was able to avoid that with God's help. So it was really a, a relationship that was one of beauty and of, of love for the things of God between Jonathan and, and David. And that will once again be united in God's kingdom when they are both there. Now, moving on to David and his wives. And if you recall, um, our brother Klaus Cassia, in his exhortation um, in relation to anger issues, and he mentioned an incident in re relation to David, which was in accordance to um, the issue of Nabal. Nabal was a rich man, but he was a fool. And David and his men had spent time in the field as shepherds. Um, well, naval shepherds, they were looking after naval shepherds. And they had requested some food to, um, for his men because they were out, out in the field. But Nabal had knocked them back and said, no, why should I give you food? I, I don't know you, I'm, I'm not gonna give you any food. And on this occasion, David acted very uncharacteristically and allowed his anger to um, rise and he was going to um, exact a very heavy toll on Nabal and his, his family. But Abigail stepped in as she did on that occasion. And we see that in 1 Samuel 25, if you re recall this occasion. And she was a faithful wife, even though her husband was foolish. She took it upon herself to appease David and prevent him from making a foolish mistake. And she took it upon herself to provide victuals or supplies to David and his men, but she came in a very gracious and humble way, acknowledging that David was indeed rightfully um, a lord and going to be a king. And the way she approached him, God blessed her in that. And it appeased David because of the way she approached. And it gives us an insight into how we can approach situations like that. When anger is involved, sometimes it's not easy to approach a person in the heat of the moment. But there are ways in which we can um, go about it to um, deal with the situation and make amends and end up with a, a, a good outcome for both parties. And we can learn from this situation between David and Abigail. 
And she is just such an awesome example of a godly woman who um, ultimately became um, David's wife. We also then need to talk about David as a king, which initially he was the king of Judah, and then he became the king of Israel. <clears throat> One of the requirements of the king was to write out a copy of the law or the Talmud as it's known and understood. And that's the first five books of the Bible. And it's something that Jewish boys do today. They learn it off by heart and that's something that they do by the age of 12. I'm not sure how many 12-year-old boys would be able to do that today, but it probably would be a good, good exercise to try and learn off by heart the first five books of the Bible. I'm not sure whether I'd be able to accomplish, accomplish that, but um, back in those days, not everybody had a Bible like we do. So to learn things off by heart, was um, something that they would have to do to listen to what the Levites or the priests um, told them to listen and understand because as they went up to the feasts and uh, those times when they were able to get together and fellowship one with another around the things of God, that's ultimately all they could do was to listen to the, the law as it was read to them and Remember those things. And as David sat down and wrote his copy of the law, he already well and truly understood the things of God as we understand him being a man of God. And we see this reflected in the many Psalms that he has written. And Psalm 119 is full of the laws and statutes and precepts and things of God. I just want to I can find the written down. Did write it. Maybe we didn't. Might have been on another piece of paper. <laughs> Thought I had included it. Maybe I didn't. Oh, you see it. Sorry, that's fine. Okay. Um. Yeah, as you go through um, Psalm 119. And it's a good exercise to highlight the um, various things that come out in Psalm 119. Laws, ways, precepts, statutes, commandments, judgments, word, testimonies, counsellors. And just to um, briefly consider those laws, it gives the idea of um, being engraven on stone. And, of course, that harks back to the law when it was given to Moses as he went up into the mountain and it was graven on the two, st two stones. And ways to, to tread or to walk a well-trodden road, i.e. on the course of life. Precepts. Um, and it has the idea of being an overseer or to take charge. Statutes. 
once again, it's referring to laws similar to that of in, being engraven on stone. Commandments, which is the Hebrew word mitzvah, the law or constitution. Judgments is the Hebrew word shafat, uh, verdict or to pr pronounce sentence. And then the word, which is dorba, to speak or to give an answer. Testimonies, to duplicate or to repeat. And counsellors, to advise or to deliberate or resolve. So all of those things were things that David understood and um, thought about as he was both out in, out in the field as a shepherd boy, but as he um, worked in his life, even as he was with the men that he was, as he was fleeing around the place um, away from Saul. From this time in the mountains, in the crags, he knew all those caves, the cave of Adullam, the caves in Ein Gedi. He knew where all those places were. Um, and Saul was searching all over the place, but um, David was very adept at being able to well and truly keep two steps ahead of him because he had an intimate knowledge of those places. So with David's, um, we have the, the time with Nabal where um, David um, had that anger issue, which was um, he was going to do the wrong thing, but Abigail stepped in. We also had the time when David was distracted. Um, he should have been out with his men in the army. So he was not occupied as he should have been. And then we have the sin of Bathsheba. And that was a low point in David's life. And that brought about lifelong consequences. And it was a, a heavy learning thing for David. But he was very quick to come to the point of repentance once Nathan the prophet pointed out to him what he had done. When he gave him the analogy of the ewe lamb, as we find in 2 Samuel. And his repentance was genuine and heartfelt. And that's the thing with sin. God is willing to forgive if we are genuine and heartfelt. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Our, the love of our God is just truly amazing. For God first loved us that he gave his only begotten son. He first loved us. Not once we had been forgiven for sin or anything. He first loved us. And we can trust in our God that he will forgive if we are genuine in our heartfelt repentance. Now, I just want to bring us to a conclusion by considering the last words of David when he comes to the end of his life in 1 Kings chapter 2. In reading verses 1 to 4.
And if we can have the, the last crowd out, thanks. Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die. And he charged Solomon, his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. And keep the charge of Yahweh thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou must prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself that Yahweh may continue his word, word, which he spake concerning me, saying, If thy children take heed to thy, their way, to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail thee, said he, a man on the throne of Israel. So there's the charge to Solomon. And that word charge means to watch, to act to hedge about or to guard. And we see in those verses, all those things that are mentioned in Psalm 119. Statutes, commandments, judgments, testimonies, the law, all of those things which David had upheld in his life as a man after God's own heart. And we now come to consider the greater than David, the son of God, who was truly a man after God's own heart. He gave his life in service to his God, to perfection. Yet he was a man like as we are, touched by the infirmity of our flesh. He understands what we go through. He, was, he is able to feel the feelings of our infirmity. And we have the opportunity each and every day to approach before our God and to seek for our forgiveness. And he is willing to forgive us for our sins each and every day. Thanks, Brother Chris. Now we come to the emblems, brothers and sisters, whereby, of course, we remember the death of our Lord and the significance of it. We're going to take the reading, just a, two or three verses, as is our custom from Matthew 26. Matthew 26, we read in uh, verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink ye all of it. For this is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now let us... Firstly, give thanks for the bread. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the provision of this bread, whereby we can contemplate the, the life of your Son, who was given on account of us and all the would be faithful down through the ages, including my people Israel, who gave his body that our sins might be forgiven. And to do that, he had to offer up to thee a perfect sacrifice, one in which all the natural desires of his nature, 
his lusts and desires were denied and resisted. And we remember, Father, that he was enabled to do this because of his peerless faith and peerless trust in thee. And thereby was able to offer up unto thee a perfect life. And we are grateful and rejoice that because of his one true perfect sacrifice, his perfect life, we can find acceptance, forgiveness and redemption through his work. That we can share in the victory that he had over sin and death. And so as we partake of the bread, we remember these things. In his name, the Lord Jesus Christ, we approach you now. And so we read, and he took, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take it, this is my body. Well, now give thanks for the wine. Heavenly Father, we similarly wish to thank you for your son whom you provided and who we remember now 
in the partaking of the wine. We know that wine represents life. And so he gave his life. A life in which sin was destroyed. The power of sin was removed and destroyed by his life of doing good. His life of perfect obedience to thee. The life poured out in love to thee and love to his brethren and sisters whom he came to redeem. A life that gained him life and will gain us life also through him. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the lamb that was slain to give us all life. And we give you our praise now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we read that he took the cup, he gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. For this is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Yeah. <laughs>
we have now had the opportunity to sing the words of one of the loveliest psalms David ever wrote. Three, five verses that end up on a very glorious note. And um, though they were written by David, you can see how the Lord Jesus Christ would have applied these to himself. And he invites us to do the same. So let us sing together hymn, hymn number 12. Brother John, and good afternoon, everyone. These are the ecclesial announcements for this week, God willing. After the memorial meeting on glass washings in the hands of sisters Christine Stokes and Lynn Rowe, uh, tonight we don't have any events in our hall, and the Chinese English seminars will resume on the 17th of July due to school holidays. Wednesday night at 8 p.m. we have our midweek Bible class, also streamed via Zoom and YouTube. Speaker for the evening, Brother Baruch Spina, and his class subject is how to be courageous or assertive. And the chairman for the evening, Brother Dan Jolly, and pianist, Sister Lisa Spina. There's no Sunday school next Sunday due to school holidays. 11 a.m. we have our memorial meeting. Our exhorter, Brother John Rowe, our chairman, Brother Ben Derricky, reader, Brother Joel Carter, and pianist, sister, Rosemary Weldon. Don't have any general announcements. Um, it's very nice to see you here this week, Brother Bill. 
Um, we'd like the, our visitors that have met with us this morning to take the greetings with them when they return to their home ecclesias. And we have two collections this week. We have the ecclesial fund in the brown bag, and we have our additional collection, which is going to be for Heritage College in the blue bag. just realized I was humming that hymn quite loudly to myself. <laughs> I hope you didn't hear me. <laughs> and then I realized I'm the chairman. <laughs> um, anyway, it was lovely. And now we can get to sing it, can't we, Lisa? So our closing hymn this morning is a, is a beautiful hymn and very positive. And um, just a reminder that singing hymns is very much an important part of our worship, brothers and sisters, is very important. Our singing of hymns together. We can encourage and lift each other up. So let's close with hymn number 207, 294. Yeah, I can
Almighty, glorious, heavenly Father, we thank you for the vision that you have just provided us in the, the hymn we have just sung together. The vision of thy kingdom presided over by thy glorious Son, who one life, who overcame sin and one life, eternal life for himself and for all those that were identified with him. And we thank you, Father, and rejoice that we have come to know you through the life of your son and through the life of faithful men like David of old, whose lives were a, a mixture of sorrow and joy. We remember David who, in the days of his youth, learnt and came to know you through the meditation on the Psalms and from the meditation of the surroundings that he enjoyed, those of the peaceful brook and the gentle green pastures in which he walked and lay. And we remember his life when, though promised that he would become the king of Israel, he was pursued by Saul, an envious and jealous man. And through his sufferings, he patiently endured. And we remember the wise counsel of wise women like Abigail. And we remember our sisters, both old and young, and our wives who can give to us wise counsel and advice when it is necessary for us. We thank you, Father, for our brothers and our brethren who can likewise exhort us and encourage us to hold on and endure until the kingdom doth come. And so as David patiently endured and finally received the kingdom, we too know that we can likewise, if we will but endure faithfully, receive the kingdom by your grace and by your goodness in due time. We thank you, Father, for all the blessings that we do have, the company of one another, the love and the uplifting company of one another, your word of truth, that beautiful word that contains so much for us to understand, the beauty and the comfort of the Psalms and the wisdom of the Proverbs that David knew. We thank you for the prophets that have left on record their word in the, even in these last times of the Gentiles and the magnificent life-saving work of the, those brethren that recorded the life of your son in four Gospels, and the, and the apostles, and, and, and what more, and the, the many other things, Father, that we could draw to mind, and that we could draw to mind if we had time. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for these precious things you have left for us to meditate on and to find strength in like your servant David did, and like your son, the Lord Jesus Christ did. And so we ask you to dismiss us with thy blessing and accept our grateful thanks, which we offer to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.